Our next guest is a close personal friend of mine and all round public health justice champion. It's Dr. Yolandra Hancock. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background about that, Dr. Hancock, she is a Louisiana original with uh, her medical degree from UCLA and a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins University. We met when I was still a medical student and Dr. Hancock was a resident at Cedar sinai Medical Center on uh, doing her pediatrics residency. And we've been, uh, you know, teammates, uh, co-conspirators, and uh, health justice champions together ever since. And yeah. now, uh, Dr. Hancock sees patients in Washington, D.C. She does great work for public health, and we are excited to have her on the show. I'm excited to be here. So, um, so Yolanda, I wanted to let our audience know that uh, last month, we went to the United States Senate offices together because we wanted to report the Trump regime's abuse of immigrant children at the border. I had uh, written an op-ed about it, and then we decided to take things up a notch because Child Protective Services told us that, you know, if you're going to report, you know, that we're not the agency to report to, you have to find uh, higher authorities. So you and I, with a couple of our colleagues, went to the United States Senate offices to uh, report the abuse of immigrant children. And I want to thank you, first off, for joining me because it meant a lot to uh, have you there. But I was just wondering if, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing your perspectives of that experience. Sure. Well, first, thank you just for the work that you do. I, you know, I am always in awe of your greatness and your voice uh, for our children, um, particularly our children um, in underserved communities, and it was an absolute joy to be able to join you in the good fight and speaking with senators. I, I think one of the feelings that I had that continues with me is the lack of sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a mother, as a pediatrician, as a public health, just as a human being, let's just, even if I didn't have a child, as a human being, just to see what's happening, it compels me to want to act. And for people in positions of authority to not have that same sense of urgency, even in the offices that were very cordial, they were cordial but slow. I mean, it was like dealing with tortoises and, and how they even responded to us. And so I think that would be sort of my first opinion of our experience was that lack of sense of urgency. And even now as I reflect on it, I just I, I still don't get it. I don't understand how human beings don't see that that is an urgent issue to take action on and when someone presents themselves asking about what actions are being taken why there wasn't more of a sense to let's sit down have a conversation find out from them particularly being pediatricians what should we be doing what should the language be what should the next actions be i definitely would have taken advantage of having our expertise there but i feel like uh, lip service was paid at least in a couple of the uh, staffers offices or the senators offices with staffers but for the most part it was just like yeah thanks keep yeah. it moving yeah yeah i i totally agree i felt that and we even talked about this during our live stream of visiting those senate offices that you definitely felt you were in the land of thoughts and prayers that right that, that's exactly it and uh and i think that you know when you go to a land of thoughts and prayers you're hoping that you know we're showing up in white coats we're announcing ourselves as pediatricians that somewhere in that you're hoping that there will be a spark of urgency that and just like you said that people will say okay doc like what are your recommendations what do you think we right. should be doing different and we were never asked that never and provided ample opportunity we didn't come in confrontational we did it to, in my in my personal of course i'm biased but in my personal opinion it was not confrontational it was carefrontational mm -hmm. so we explained why we were there the urgency with which we were there and we were met with mm -hmm, thank you for coming in let's see if someone can speak with you or you can leave public comments on our website like that was the, the highest level of engagement were the two staffers, I believe, from Tennessee who actually had the decency to sit down and talk with us. But even in that, they did not take the opportunity to ask us, 
what we thought would be best, especially given we know from a scientific, from an evidence-based standpoint, what the effect of separation is. Even within a 24-hour period of time, these children, the, the levels of stress between the children and their parents facilitates permanent change. And so the longer this goes on, the more damage is being done. And those are the kinds of questions that need to be asked. What's the window of time that we need to be working with to get these children back to their parents? What, what should the legislation look like? How do the conversations play out when we approach Democrats about joining in on this? Instead, it was, well, at the end of our conversation with them, it was talk to the Democrats, too, to make sure they agree with what we write was pretty much right. what was said. Right. And I felt that they were, that there was a lot of pushback when we raised the point of when it comes time to write tax breaks for billionaires, these guys are willing to burn the midnight oil. They're willing to scribble notes on the sides of bills that are being voted upon. Meanwhile, you know, brown kids at the border or black kids in, in Flint, Michigan can't right. get, you know, that kind of diligence. And... It, it was, I, th I thought that it was a stark contrast that we were presenting that, I, you know, again, like you were saying, we're not there to shame or humiliate them, but we had to point out to them that there is a difference in diligence depending right. on who they feel they are equipped to serve. Right. And I think, you know, it, 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 I had to catch myself because for a minute I felt like shaming somebody when mm -hmm. folks didn't even have the guts to sign a letter uh, make it, taking a position on how wrong this is. They didn't even have, you know, the courage to write their names on a letter to the president, letting him know, as I'm sure genteelly as it was likely written, they didn't even have the compassion to sign their names on a letter, let alone take steps to make a change. And then, of course, when he signs this executive order, theoretically ending the process, it's, there's still thousands of children who, are being, who have been separated from their parents, and now they've gotten an extension on, on getting them back together. And so, again, you have a continued damaging effect that no one feels is urgent to take action. And I'm sure with a, the with a stroke of a pen with a phone call, that can be changed. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, and it, it really is about the question of who are you willing to pull all-nighters for? Like, who are you willing to lose sleep, you know, to sacrifice time with family and do the job, do the work for right. the, that these kids need? And exactly. I, I was really struck by just uh, the, the calm apathy. It was, it, it was very striking to me that... Uh, that people could be so calm and so apathetic. But I guess that's what you get for a field trip to the land of thoughts and prayers. Right. But, and I have to say, you know, on the flip side, I, I have to give a little bit of criticism to my, to my Democrats over in the space, too, because everyone went home on a recess. Like, children's lives are at stake. Families are at stake. No one, no one should be on recess. Like, treat this like someone snatched your kids out of your hands is how I see it. Like, for you and I as pediatricians, when kids are coming in sick and they come in at 445, we're technically off work at 5 p.m., but guess what we do? We take our stethoscopes back out, we put our white coats back on, and we go back to work. That's right. We don't punt kids out because it's time for us to go home. So I would compel anyone, you know, who's in Congress to, to fight the fight. Don't, don't be passive. Treat these families as if they were your own. I think we separate ourselves. We, there's a very much this us versus them mentality here in the country, and it's certainly more evident now that Trump's in office. But even on, quote, unquote, our side, we still see the same thing. Like there should be leaders in the Democratic Party that continue to champion, not just to confront folks in his camp, but in general, we should be out marching rallying every single day. It shouldn't be when it makes the five o'clock news cycle. It literally should be every day. Right. And, you know, to me, I understand the purpose of having these congressional recesses is so that members of Congress can go back to their local home uh, district offices, meet with voters. To me, I feel that just like you're saying, the the Democrats or the Republicans, why not have these town hall meetings at the gates of the exactly. detention centers. And, exactly. and to me, I think that that would at least send a sign to voters that, hey, 
we're not brushing this under the rug. We're not doing our usual thoughts and prayers. We're demanding some answers. And exactly. I agree. I think that that would be a, an appropriate uh, course of action to take. Right. I mean, and I think the other problem is that the rules keep changing, right? So yeah. there were a group of moms in New York who realized that they could collectively raise bail money for these parents that have been imprisoned. And so they started to do that. They've actually helped to release, I believe, like three moms. Now they're putting a law in, in action to prevent people from being able to post bail. Like, wh what's the purpose in doing that? Then, you, then clearly the passion, whatever it is that you claim to have to reunify families, is just, it's, it's a sham. Right. When you take away what little resources we have to be able to connect these families in a legal way while we're still waiting for you to get your act together because right. you hadn't, clearly they hadn't planned on reunifying these children, otherwise there would have already been a system in place. Correct. And, and I think what I find so frustrating about that is that there are those of us who know how to act with diligence and urgency, and we're being told when these kinds of obstacles are put in our way, yeah, we don't, you're, not, you're, you're not the ones who should be doing this, or that's not mm -hmm. the kind of action that should be taken here. But um, I do appreciate you, Dr. Hancock, for, you know, I mean, your, all your diligence, all your urgency. I wanted to uh, bring the audience, uh, I wanted to let them know that you and I are going to be on a Medicare for All panel in, at Netroots Nation in uh, New Orleans, uh, in your home state of Louisiana. And yes. I, we don't have too much time, but I was wondering if you could give us a brief preview of, uh, of what you'll be sharing about Medicare for All uh, when we're in New Orleans. So I think one of the most important pieces is for people to truly understand what Medicare for All means to everyone so that they can back it. Um, folks really don't understand how different Medicaid and Medicare are in terms of coverage, how important it is as ACA continues to be chipped away that there has to be a viable way in which people receive their right in terms of health care. So really having a conversation about the impact that the Affordable Care Act has had particularly within the African-American community, we know that as a result of ACA, it's cut the uninsured rate in half for African-Americans. With us dealing with so many health disparities as it is, the better access we have to coverage, the more we're going to be able to tackle those health disparities. And one of the main ways to do that is to be able to expand Medicare in the way that uh, Bernie Sanders has described, in, in a way that gradually over time allows every U.S. resident to be able to be covered in the way that our seniors are currently covered under the Medicare system. To link insurance to, to work, particularly for me as a small business owner, it's, it's incredible the cost that is a result of having as, in, in terms of providing coverage. And so when you link health insurance to employment, it puts people at a handicap particularly those who end up working part-time, creating their own businesses or are working for small businesses. And a lot of African-American folks here in the United States find themselves in those positions. People in general find themselves in that position. And to be able to understand how ridiculous it is to tie health insurance benefits to certain employers, because employers have the ability to adjust work hours, all of these things to negate their requirement to cover um, their employees. And what we really have to understand that health coverage, health is not a benefit, it's a right. And being able to link in to Medicare for All to show why it's so important for every citizen here in the country to back it, that's going to be my goal when we're there in New Orleans. Awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm really excited for uh, our work together in New Orleans and bringing this message and really you know, encouraging even the Medicare for All movement to remember the all in Medicare for All. I think that, exactly. uh, you know, as much as I appreciate my colleagues and allies in the, in the health justice movements to protect the Affordable Care Act, uh, and even when it was being built in 2009, mm -hmm. I, I appreciated that they cared about health equity but I'm hoping that in the next chapter, when we build Medicare for All, that 
overcoming minority health disparities is not just a good intention on the back burner, but is an upfront priority agenda item with action steps. And I'm excited to build that with you. I am as well, my friend. La lucha continua. That's right. That's right. And, um, you know, I think the... Uh, the other element of, of the Medicare for All movement, the challenge that's going to be uh, you know, in front of us is how to do that um, outreach to communities mm -hmm. that you know, don't feel like they have a seat at the table. And, right. and uh, we're fortunate to have um, you know, physician activists like yourself uh, you know, to really keep this, these issues up front and in focus. And yeah, I just want to uh, thank you, Dr. Hancock, for joining us on the Zero Hour today. It's been my absolute pleasure. I look forward to fighting this good fight with you.